Hello, my apocalypse survivors. This week, we present to you the penultimate in the series of interviews from our summer break between seasons four and five. Penultimate is a great word. You can use that to impress your friends at cocktail parties. It means second to last in our modern usage. The literal Latin translation is closer to almost last. However, the term cocktail is believed to be from a description of a horse's pedigree or even from giving a horse a suppository. I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows. But anyhow, the reason you care is that I will post one more interview after this one and then start Season 5. It looks like on the 6th of September, 2024. I really enjoyed speaking with George. We had a great conversation, a lot of energy. He's a science fiction writer, and we talked a lot about the craft of writing and what we love about science fiction, and I hope you enjoy it too. I think you will. The interview is just over 20 minutes long, so nice and quick, and I'll come back a little bit at the end with an update. So uh, give us the 200 words on who you are and what you do. Sure. Uh, George Allen Miller. I am a science fiction, fantasy, a little bit of horror writer. I live in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, Washington, D.C. proper. So there are some folks that get ruffled that they say they, you know, they're in Maryland or Virginia. I am actually in Washington, D.C. Um, I have a book that came out. It's been a good while now, in August of last year, uh, Eugene J. McGilligetti's Alien Detective Agency. It's a humorous science fiction novel. And the sequel is coming out in October. So uh, October 23, uh, 23, 20, October 23, 2024, <laughs> the sequel will land on shelves. So I'm very excited about that. And I'm working on the final book in the series right now, trying to get that draft out as fast as I possibly can, because it's been a good it's been a good amount of time between the first book coming out and the sequel. So I'm trying to shorten that for the third. Right. And so do, once you, you know, I know you're heavily into the, the publishing uh, mechanics from what I've heard you speak on, prognosticate on in other forums. Yep. Is is there some sort of rule of thumb to that? How close one book should be on the next one? Because I've it, heard people say, well, you know, wait till you have three and then go all at once and this sort of thing. But it, it is interesting. So it depends. Uh, I heard an agent uh, mention this to me once. She said, it depends on how you are publishing your novel. If you are doing self-publishing, you do it one way. If you're doing you know, small press, you do it another way. If you're doing the big five or traditional, you do it a third way. So big five, traditional, the big five publishers, or, you know, one of the other lar very large publishing houses, typically you want to publish one book a year. Yeah. That's what the, the rate is. On the other end of that spectrum, if you're a self-publisher, she said, if you want to have, now, you, so well, I caveat this with, you can do it wherever you want. All right. Yeah. Uh, so how you decide, how you define success. So if it's success is selling lots of books, if you are a self-publisher, you really need to target four to five books per year in order yeah. to be able to stay relevant and stay current because you don't have the arm strength of the traditional fives marketing power to stay relevant. So you really just got to hammer those books out there. And the folks that have done that, if you look at the humor, science fiction, and fantasy category in Amazon, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of serial books in there, a lot of series books. And these books are coming out every two, three months. They're just hammering these things out. And they're very successful. People, you know, that's just, that's one way to be successful monetarily in publishing. It's successful because by doing that much volume, they create demand for each other. So there's a cumulative effect of the all the books together. That's sort correct. A, a snowball. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely okay. right. So because of the way the algorithms work. It's not just the well, the algorithms are definitely a big part of it nowadays, right? These computer algorithms that decide if you know how much the it's going to self promote inside of Amazon itself, but the readers too. If I read you know a really good book, I want the writer wants them to stay in that reader's mind as long as possible, so they buy the second book. And the way to do that is you throw the second book out there pretty darn fast. There's definitely like a series that I was reading, and the third book is like it's been two or three years. Yeah. The third book is since the second book's come out, and I'm just waiting for it. Like, you know, I've forgotten everything that went yeah. on there. Do I even really want the third book? Because the author's not as invested in getting this to me as fast as possible. 
Uh, a great example, George R. R. Miller, right? Martin, Martin, sorry, Miller's me. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh. George R. Martin, you know, the, he, he, it took forever. It's been like 16 or 17 years since the series started for, for Game of Thrones. And we're not all the way finished. The final book is in, I mean, I think there's a, two, a, two or three still books that he still has to get out. I kind of gave up at book three just because I was I didn't know if I was going to get all of the series in my hand to be able to finish reading them. I have a funny story about that in that I was down, I remember I was on vacation down Cape Cod and I found one of those books somehow, somewhere mm -hmm. at a used book or something, right? And it wasn't called Game of Thrones. It had some other title. Yeah, and, so there's Game of Thrones, then Storm of Swords, then Clash of Kings. Oh, I'm sorry. Clash of Kings was the second book. Uh, and I'm I'm forgetting which ones were which, but I don't know. But it, it, but I read through it, and I was like, you know, and it was hard. You had to read it straight through because otherwise you forget all the characters. He's got so many different storylines going on at the same time, and eventually they all sort of converge. But if you put it down for eight hours, you know, it's almost like having to go back to college. Right. It, it's uh, it's pretty hard. Now imagine there's five books in the series that are out right now. And there's all the other characters that have come along. He's adding new characters along the way. Right. And right. so I, if I'm going to wait, you know, two or three years for book six, well, I've forgotten everything about all these other characters. So I, I kind of have to have that refresher course. Yeah. And I was and I remember watching the HBO thing when it came out. And I'm going, this is oddly familiar. <laughs> I've, I've heard of some of these characters before. But, yeah, it was interesting. It's, it was kind of book. But for me, anyhow, that the only way I could read a book like that would be on vacation. Because otherwise, I just wouldn't have the headspace for it. You know, it wouldn't be something I could read 10 pages a night on like I normally do with the other uh, science fiction I'm reading and the other genres. It takes dedication to read um, his books all the way through. You know, I'm, I'm now I don't want to like throw him under the bus or anything. I love George R. R. Martin. I love his books. I think he's a fantastic author. He's just slow. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's slow to ripen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But very rich. On the other hand, that's what people get. It's a, such a rich universe oh, that he's developed, right? Brilliant, rich, yeah. filled. The characters are full and there's life. It's just they, they come out pretty slow. So, um, But yeah. for him, he can do that because he has the traditional publishers behind him. He's got these big houses behind him. He right. can take his time. And you know, he's still going to sell a lot of books. Yeah. And when I think about that self-publishing, you know, four books a year sort of model, it just impresses me that that's a bit of a hamster wheel, right? And I wonder how much quality suffers. I mean, there's got to be, there's gifted people who can do that. You know, the AI is going to be able to do that in a, in a couple of years. But, you know, I, I wonder about that because it's just like, how do you keep going on that treadmill without, I don't know, it seems a little bit off to me for some reason. I don't know if it's a sustainable or not. You've you got to find your groove. You've got to find your your what what you can what your skill set where your skill set is strong. Your group. Stephen King does a book I think about every three to four months. Right. Yeah. He's just prolific. Yeah. But he does it full time. You know that's his, that's his only job. So that's a big thing too. If you if it's your only job, you're you you have a better chance of doing it. Then it's like then it is like kind of like a job. Your job is to come in and write three thousand words a day. And if you write three thousand words a day in ninety days, that's going to be a significant amount of work that you're going to have on the table. So I, I think finding your groove, finding what you want to write, um, having that method of, uh, you know, I'm going to write this. I'm going to like come up with new ideas uh, on, you know, at 7 p.m. I'm going to write in the morning. I'm going to edit in the middle of the day. And that's my pattern. And that's what I'm going to just see if I can get to work. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, a regular job, right? Right, you, right. You're, yeah, yeah. You're, Especially uh, if, if, yeah, if you layer the marketing on top of that, then it's it's kind of like a regular job plus another job. Right. right, right, yeah, exactly, exactly yeah. right. If you're an accountant, you have to come in, and you have to crunch numbers for eight hours. But you're a writer, so you have to come in and you have to write for eight hours. So right. you know, it's a life yep. we have. To nope, I get that. So you came to this authorship right in your science fiction. I want to talk about your book in a second. I have not read it, but I I think I'm going to because it sounds fantastic. Oh, thank um, you. You came to this pretty late in life. Actually, I came to it pretty early, but so this is kind of a funny story. So I was I was writing my first stories when I was 15. Yeah. I was writing science fiction. I was writing stories. I wrote a first novel when I was in my 20s, and it was just like 700 page, you know, monstrosity that was absolutely terrible. It'll never see the light of day. It's locked away in a safe 
And the safe has a trigger that's going to send it to the bottom of the ocean if anybody even goes near it. I wrote another book after that just to see if I could write like a regular sized book. I did. That was also a mess and a disaster. I wrote that when I was in my 30s, I think. Uh, again, you know what? This is terrible. I, I, I realized I didn't know what I was doing, even though I had the passion to want to write. So then in my 30s, in my 40s too, I started really trying to just figure out the craft of writing. I took a lot of, you know, you know classes. I went to a lot of different conventions. Um, there was definitely these uh, uh, like Futurescapes, which is this online writer's workshop, which is fantastic. You know, I never did Odyssey or, you know, Clarion West or any of the big ones, uh, I, but I found some local ones and some smaller ones that are online. And that really helped. That really figured out, whoa, okay, this is what a story actually is. This is like, you know, the three act story structure. Yeah. This is my intention. This is what a protagonist is. This is who an antagonist is. This is what plot means. And for a long time, I didn't know what a plot was. I was like, yeah. <laughs> writing, just going crazy. Like, hmm, what? And then somebody said to me once, what's the plot of the story? And I said, huh, what is plot? Yeah. Great. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I, I really came early in life to writing, but I think I finally found a groove. When I'm in, you know, in my fifties, because now I'm in my fifties. Yeah. Do you find you have more time now, oh. or just yeah, no, no. Well, I mean, yeah. the kids are a little bit older. One kid's in college, you know. One kid is still in high school, but they're, you know, they they. Uh, so I definitely have some more time than when the kids were young, right? So that does help quite a lot. And I found a little bit of a group. I I am very very for, very fortunate that I get to work from home in my real job. So I don't have the commute. Um, I guess a lot of people, you know, post COVID are still doing the work from home thing. So I, I blessed by that. So, you know, instead of doing my hour commute each way to work and home, I can spend that hour writing. Right. right. So, that's my time. Yeah. Like, so that's very, very helpful. Yeah. So you're a morning guy or a night guy? For writing, I am a 100% morning guy. 100%. Have, yeah. Yep. I have my morning. I get up at like 6, uh, 630, have my coffee, come up and try to hit as many words as I can yeah. before I get to work. Right. Yep. And then. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, because I don't have a commute, I can go to work immediately after I finish writing. So yep. I can finish my last word of my writing, and I can turn to my work computer. I can turn it on. I can start answering my emails and going to work. So that yep. is extraordinarily helpful. No, I like that too. And because I I find it's very difficult to um, to change back and forth. There's a for some reason with white writing for me anyhow. There's an enormous switching cost. Mm. Um, so the mornings. Yeah, 5 a.m., just heads down, do it. That's the best time, right? I'm also, I well, I used to be a software developer. And it, there's a big overlap between software development and writing because they're both very creative workflows. When I was heads down writing software, and as it always happens, someone comes and knocks on your door, hey, can you make that you know color blue? Can you make it actually look red but still be blue in the programming code? Uh, what? Uh, sure. But that's like now I'm totally dis- derailed. And what I was thinking about as far as writing code or something else to answer some crazy, you know, new request that uh, somebody has. It doesn't have, you know, because business has crazy requests that are almost times just impossible or don't even make any sense. But that is a gear shift down, just like you said. Writing is the same way. You'll have a gear shift down if you switch to anything else almost. Like, you know, so I have to like have my blinders on and just focus on writing. Something else kicks off. You know, CNN is on. Some giant disasters just happen in the world, and well, I'm down. I'm gear shifting, and that's not. Yeah, and if and if you get really lucky, you'll drop into the zone where it just starts to happen on its own, and that's that's the wondrous, wonderful magic place, right? That that is fantastic. I love when like you know you you get into the right gear and you just hit that zone mode, and then you can just I'm and you know you back your mind, you're like go, you're there. It's like then you're just typing as fast as you possibly can. You don't even care about typos. And right. sometimes the name of like, like you might have a new character or a new city or a new alien race or whatever it might be. And you just, I, what I do is in all caps, I say, name this alien later. And I just keep going. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Or find this word later. Yeah. All right. <laughs> insert yeah. really cool dialogue or insert really cool description of this world later. Go. <laughs> yeah. 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 And it's because your mind's already three sentences ahead and you're trying to catch up. Right. Yes. Actually, yeah. that, that's actually a great technique that I learned again. So I'll put a shout out to if you're in Washington, D.C., the Bethesda Writers Workshop has fantastic writer workshops. Um, They're one offs. Uh, They last like six weeks or so. Some of them are actually just one day. But one of the teachers there mentioned that he's like, you know, when I write my novels, the teacher said, I don't this is a draft. I'm not writing the finished product right now. So I give myself the leeway of 
I, I'm not going to stop and figure out the name of the city or the town or or the description of a building right here. I'm just going to write, this is a sequence of events that I'm writing. And yeah. Really- yeah. And sometimes when you're not in the flow and you're just sort of brick by brick putting sentences down, that's very useful because then you can come back to that as a draft and read it and go, this is where the ornamentation fits, or this is where, you know, this is where that idea fits. So it gives you a, um, a scaffolding to hang your creativity on. 100%. And you have to be okay with that, right? You have to give yourself some grace that, you know, you may not be in the zone, but if you're doing, if you're at the brick by brick stage, it's okay. Give yourself the grace of saying, I only wrote a hundred words today, but they were a good hundred words. I, yeah. I put a lot of really, I put the foundational bricks in. And now yeah. that I have the foundational bricks in, I can go crazy. Now I can go, I can switch to wood and I can just yeah. cut this down real quick. Yeah. I got something done today. I think is the bottom line, right? You want to make sure you get something done every day. Right. As long as you make, you know, there was this actually, so SIFWA, Science Fiction Writers of America Conference just ended. And one of the pod, uh, one of the guests on one of the panels, you know, said, sometimes you, it's tiny habits. It's like, yep. you know, hey, my tiny habit is I'm going to write 10 words. Okay, I wrote 10 words. Cool. I'm good. I'm happy. I wrote my 10 words. And then tomorrow I'm going to write 20 words, 30 words, 50 words. And that's okay. You know, get yourself into those tiny habits that build yourself up. I think that was that was just a great Panel. Yeah, you can stack up little things over time and you get a big thing. Right. hundred percent. So it's consistency and endurance like everything else. I was listening to you being interviewed and talking about your book, uh, McGillicuddy's book, right? And yeah. before you even said, before you even gave the reference, I said, that's Dirk Gently's detective agency. <laughs> right. So, I, you know, I'll come clean. I, I'm a huge fan of... Douglas Adams. I'm a huge fan of Terry Pratchett. I'm a huge fan of like, you know, the British, Mary Gentle, sure. British comedy act uh, fans and things. It's nothing like Dirk Gently's holistic tech. I cannot. So I def- I was very, very careful to say, I do not want this to be a bad version of Douglas Adams novels. Right. This is not going to be that. So I definitely had specific tones in place. I definitely had, you know, there's some, I think there's some humor in there. I think it's, you know, I try to add my version of humor to it, my personal spin on it. It's definitely some a homage, you know, uh, you know, yeah. uh, to, to, to Douglas Paddock or uh, Douglas Adams. No question. He's brilliant. He's the king. I, I didn't I, I just hope it does not come across come across as bad Douglas Adams. No, because that's I love that stuff, too. Right. The Monty Python. I mean, I grew up with that stuff. And if you look under the covers, there's you can deconstruct that and understand the mechanism behind that, right? There's a lot of absurdity. There's a lot of deadpan. So for that, you need a straight, you know, a straight person to take the, the right. comedic person, right? Yes. And, and you, you know, for the absurdity, you need the setup. You need to say it's, it's, it's one, two, and three, where three is the absurd thing, right? I, I totally agree, right? You, and you yeah. get into that rhythm. So you can deconstruct that that kind of humor, that kind of writing. And that's actually kind of fun as a writer to look at, to try to fold in a style or a genre into a story, right? It's it's kind of fun. It's, it's a lot of fun. So I had a lot of fun writing this novel, I had a lot of fun writing the sequel. I'm having a lot of fun writing the third book in the series. So, you know, at the end of the day, I'm trying to, so for a long time, I was always trying to, I was, I was trying to do short, short fiction, short stories. I'm not a good at short fiction writer. I mean, I actually do have some that are published out there. Some of them are professionally published, but I am not very good at short fiction because I just I meander. I like to have a I like to do world building in my fiction, and it's very hard to do world building in a short fiction story because they have to be very tight. Right. It, it, you know, every movement in a short fiction piece has to be perfect and precise and exact. And I don't like that. <laughs> I want to yeah. meander. I want to like. I want to go over here a little bit. I want to go over there a little bit because that's what life is. Life is meandering. So I, I like doing that a little bit. So, what's your biggest influences in terms of reading? Uh, you know, I think so. I started my reading vent journey uh, when I was I don't know what uh, 10, 15, 12 years old when my brother brought in a giant stack of uh, individually wrapped books. It was like, you know, 12 of them was like, here, this is Isaac Asimov. And yeah. it was the Robot Empire and Foundation series for I- by Isaac Asimov. Yeah. I was like, uh, okay, you know, I'm a typical 10-year-old, whatever. <laughs> I don't like you. You're an adult. Go away. 
But I opened the first book and I was like, huh, that's a cool cover. That looks kind of neat. And I was like, all right, fine. And I read it and I was like, did I just read? Holy cow. So then I blasted through all 12 books. Then I thought that was a great. Then I went, you know, Heinlein and then I went, you know, Arthur C. Clarke. And then I went through all the classics as, as much as I could. Then I found Terry Pratchett and Douglas Adams. And I was like, oh, whoa. So yeah, I can I can the you can take science fiction and you can make it humorous and weird. Yeah. That really, really appealed to me. So then I read all of those books. So that was really cool. So that's kind of where my foundation was. And now I'm just sort of like all over the place. I, I love Alistair Reynolds. I love Peter Hamilton. Those oh, are Peter great. Hamilton's good. I, I read one of his that was really compelling. Yeah. I, I like his weirdness because, you know, yeah. he, uh, a lot of things that are just, I, I, I like Peter Hamilton a lot. I'm a huge fan. I think yeah. he's the modern uh, king of the, the Isaac Asimov style science fiction right now. Yeah, yeah. Alistair Reynolds is also very good. Alistair Reynolds, I mean, he's also fantastic. I'm reading his book uh, as well. Yeah, there's a lot of good current modern hard sci-fi that's worth that's worth reading. Tremendous, uh, and you know, um, of course, you can't like Broken Earth trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. That was fantastic. There's so many books out there that I, I, I like the books that are just a little bit different, a little bit weird. Um, Xenogenesis by Octavia Butler. That changed my life. I mean, that was just so wow. This is like this is how far you can take an imaginative world. And she took it so far and different. And NK Jemison took it so far and different. And it's just like, okay. It's almost like it's almost like when someone is that when that book comes out and those books are so successful, it gives you permission to be able to go that far. Right. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they've gone to the edge, right? right? They're they're an example. Yeah. They've gone yeah. to the Maybe I can go to the edge. Maybe I can actually push the envelope here. Yeah, That's all that all that great sci-fi. Have you ever dipped into any sort of classical literature, like you know your your Russian, your James Joyce, you know all that stuff? I actually have James Joyce in my library. I have some of the classics, but I look at them and it's like I look at that book, and then I look at a book like you know oh, <laughs> aliens. This book has monsters, <laughs> like you know, yeah. So, like, yeah, but this book has like, you know, this really cool thing with this like, you know, robot alien artificial intelligence. And why can't I read that instead? So it's always on my mind to go back to one of those and read it. But as you I just I keep gravitating. It's it's, it's more like studying at that point, huh? It's like <laughs> studying. It's like I know it's fantastic. <laughs> I know it's great. Well, we were talking about style, right? So if you wanna, you know, read it as a as a workshop on style, you know, you could read some Chekhov, you could read some Hemingway, some well, Joyce, right? It's not necessarily entertaining, but it's educational. I will say I do love reading him, some Hemingway short stories. Yeah. Man was, I don't know how he did some of that stuff. It was masterful. I mean, and, and that's kind of almost when I gave up on short stories. So I was like, I can never, I can't do this. I mean, this yeah. is, I cannot figure out how he was able to pack so much into it. I guess it's because, you know, he's focusing on character and character motivation and character arcs and character development. But I like world building. I like seeing, you know, what the world is. And that takes time. Yeah, it's very, very parsimonious. And the words have a lot of weight to them. And there's almost as, almost as much being said as not being said. Yes. Right? And so it's very, it's very I don't know, pixelated. Almost, yes. yeah. Just absolute brilliance. But, uh, you know, I, I do definitely classify myself as a world builder. I like building worlds. And when you build a world, it's really hard to build a world in 3,500 words and have a character arc and have, you know, you know, all that kind of stuff. There are definitely writers that can do it. I don't know that I am one. <laughs> that that right. takes. So tell us a little bit about the, the book. Give us the title, where people can find it, and uh, give us a little synopsis sounds hilarious yeah no eugene j mcgillicuddy's alien detective agency um you can get it on amazon.com uh, or all the online books as well like kobo apple etc uh google it is about a semi uh omniscient psychic detective who can answer any question if you ask it directly to him the answer automatically pops into his mind and he's living inside of a universe that is filled with thousands and thousands and perhaps even millions of alien races Earth has basically taken itself to the brink of disaster. Uh, we basically, you know, after years of trying to destroy our planet, we actually did. 
then the aliens basically came down and said, okay, that's it. That's enough. You're no longer able to govern yourselves. You're now part of the um, Galactic, Soci Galactic Society for Suicidal Species. You will now be under our um, direct supervision, and we were going to make sure that you don't do this again and bring your society back to life. So he is uh, tasked with uh, finding uh, uh, a case involving a couple of other diplomatic aliens. So the you know Galactic Congress is based on Earth, no, not based on Earth, but they have an off they have a you know an embassy on Earth. There's a lot of like DC. So I live in Washington DC. So there's definitely a lot of buildings and references in Washington DC. There's an old uh, warehouse here that I use uh, in the tucked in a nice little corner, a Woodward and Lothrop warehouse uh, tucked in a nice little corner in DC. Uh, that. Uh, features prominently in the book. Um, there's definitely bars and restaurants and places uh, where he's walking around in Chinatown and DC and different uh, locations that I, I've included. Um, and and you have a nice uh, Douglas Adams twist on the on the AI sentience. Yes, so he has a partner who is Eddie, who is an AI sentient that he uh, spontaneous. So in this world, uh, alien. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, AI spontaneously comes to life because the computers they build are just too good. Then, So the software running on the computers, it's like you put a simple computer program into a quantum computer and, and all of a sudden the computer program says, hey, I'm alive. <laughs> what is, why am I, I don't want, and Eddie is one of those programs that this has happened to. He is a control routine. He was a control routine in an ergonomic office chair, uh, calculating posture positions for individuals when they sat down. And he came into uh, sentience and Jack, uh, Eugene Jack McKilligutty, Rescued him in the middle of a alley as he was trying to roll himself to safety because he didn't know what was going on. <laughs> That's um, hilarious. Yes. That's hilarious. You must have had a blast writing this. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot <laughs> yeah. of fun. Yeah. So were you a panther or a plotter with these? Do you lay it out ahead of time or? I tried to paint. So those first two novels I mentioned when I first wrote, those were panther novels. Yeah. And it just doesn't work. I, I saw so You don't get anywhere, right? You end up in a, like, yeah, like, a cul-de-sac. Like, you get like sixty thousand words in, and you're like, "Oops, wait a minute!" <laughs> but that's not this. Whole, if that if that doesn't work, then the last sixty thousand words don't work. So I have become a plotter. It, it, it's okay. I, I always like being a pantser, but I I have to be a plotter when it comes to novels. But I try to be a, a plot sir. Uh, like I'm not a plotter. I'm not a pantser. I'm a plot sir. Right. I, right. I, so you like signposts right exactly that's just, that's what i've learned works best as well because otherwise it just it's not all that creative <laughs> right it's, it's a little bit too structured the yeah. story has to flow on its own it has to have a life of its own and the characters have to sometimes tell you what's going to happen and what they're going to do and the world has and, to happen by itself yeah and you find new characters while you're writing and a hundred percent you do sometimes you're like hey that's a cool character that's really neat i'll give him some yeah. more life that yep. kind of thing. Yep. So I just the signpost of, you know, alien comes in here. Uh, mystery. Here's where we're trying to get to. Here's where we're trying to get to. You know, here's the ending, you know, where I'm trying to go to and then try to, you know, build it out a little bit from there. But then it yeah. pants the chapters. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll, I'll uh, move you to the exit here. Where can people uh, find you? Sure. Uh, you can find me at georgeallenmiller.com. That's uh, George, A-L-L-E-N, Miller.com. You can sign up for my newsletter. You can check out my blog posts. I do have a great friend, um, Mr. Jerome Stewart, who did some artwork for me. So either, so he actually is an artist based out of Dayton, Ohio. He did custom artwork for the novel, so you can go check it out there. And uh, georgeallenmiller.com, you can find the book on Amazon and where, el where else your electric books are sold. <laughs> yeah, I think that would make a great, a great screenplay as well, right? You get some good characters there, so you'll have to uh, roll it out. Yeah. I'll out. Announce this now if Netflix would like to give me a call to uh, work yeah. <laughs> together. Hey, you know, my door's yep. open. <laughs> yep, just bring a briefcase full of cash and we'll get working on it. And that offer extends to Amazon and Apple as well. How about that? <laughs> yeah, I think those days might be over. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for your time. I'm going to let you go. All right, sir. Appreciate so it. Much. Good luck with everything. Thank you Cheers. very much. See, that was a good high-energy interview, and we'll need to get him back on when his next book drops. I did acquire his first book on Kindle for $3.99 <laughs> and plan to add it to my rotation. It sounds funny. I have been reading and listening to a lot of books this summer, probably close to a dozen at this point. 
I won't bore you with all the reviews, but reading for me is essentially research into the craft, right? It's fuel for the fire. It's research into the craft of writing, as well as entertainment, you know, keep me from getting bored. I think we all need input, though. Input feeds the rock tumblers in our brains. So thank you, survivors, for bearing with me as I work through the Between Seasons interregnum programming. I have mapped out Season 5. Yay! And I have started writing. Double yay! I expect the first new episode to drop, like I said, on Friday, September 6th. Maybe a week earlier for subscribers over on ACAS, so we are close. As of today, we have, drumroll please, 500 members in our Facebook group. And you can join our Facebook group, which is mostly dad jokes and movie references right now. You can go over there and do that. You can subscribe on ACAST or Patreon to support the show. You can buy me a coffee. The links are in the show notes and on my website at oldmanapocalypse.com. I hope you have been gathering up firewood and food because winter is coming. I'll meet you back at the bunker. Keep surviving. Mm -hmm.